You're listening to episode 103, Overcoming Pain and Struggle to Become Bulletproof, with Justin Peck. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors, by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thanks so much for tuning in. I'm going to be joined today by Justin Peck, who is a bipolar mental health expert and pro off-road racer. He's also the author of his recent book, Bulletproof which gives insight into a life full of pain, struggle, and the perseverance required to overcome it all. It's said that Justin's story has the power to inspire anyone looking for light at the end of the dark tunnel that everyday life sometimes seems to be. So we're going to talk today about the challenges of living with bipolar disorder, as well as Justin's experience growing up bullied because of his differences. In particular, he's going to talk about how he was born with no fear of consequences or risk, and how that affected the decisions he made, and how racing makes the chaos of the outside world go away, the moment when he tried to end it all, and what ended up happening instead, the difference between class one and class two bipolar disorder, his reason for writing his book, how he makes mental health a priority for himself, and his biggest challenge in living with bipolar disorder. And like Justin says that his book is for anyone, I believe what we talk about here today is for anyone as well who is looking for some inspiration and hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into this one, and I'm going to bring Justin on. Justin, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and you know I'm really excited and honored to have you on the show. And so I came across you through Radio Guest List, and I was intrigued to learn more about your story based on what I read about you there. And I'm going to read just a snippet of what was written there to give listeners a peek into your story. It says, as a child, he knew he was different, extremely emotional, highly sensitive, overly thrill-seeking, and in many cases, debt-defying. He grew up to be a man of insane highs and lows. He took greater risks, stopped at nothing, and achieved more than he ever dreamed, simply because he wasn't afraid to fail. With barely a high school education, he became a race car champion, successful entrepreneur, and an inventor. Justin Peck tells the true story of a man who learned to rethink the life he wanted to end, master his inner dialogue, and create the mindset that's made him truly bulletproof. And of course, Justin, Bulletproof is the name of your new book that came out recently, which we'll talk about here today. But first, I'd like to get into your story a little bit. Can you tell us, yeah, can you tell us about what life was like for you growing up? You said you knew you were different. When did you start to feel that way, and what did different look like? I guess different for um, for some is different than others, right? So yeah, uh, with me growing up, uh, I knew that just kind of the way that my mind processes worked was uh, was different than my friends and so I would come up with with different ideas or different ways of of seeing kind of how how the world worked and they were always different um than than my peers and what I noticed is that because of that um because my ideas and and my thoughts were a little different um I had a tendency of being picked on and bullied and and that really went on for pretty much all of my all of my schooling years from from elementary school to high school so uh you know for me it was i learned at a at a very young age that it was better to kind of to keep my thoughts and my and my way of thinking to myself and it's something that i think that i probably have mastered over the course of my years is uh is I'm really good at hiding the actual emotion that's that's deep inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and I mean, tell us more about the bullying because um, I know a lot of my listeners can relate to that. 
Um, so it sounds like it went on for a little while for you. Um, what was kind of the nature of it? Well, uh, for me, I mean, like, like I even remember the first day of, of, of kindergarten, right? So, it, you know, I mean, I show up, um, I was, I'm, I'm kind of a short guy, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not very tall. And so, you know, in, in school, I was always typically the shortest kid in school. And, uh, you know, I remember uh, the first day of kindergarten was out playing and, and playing with my friends and one of the older kids had had pushed me off one of the swings well instead of instead of having the mindset to stand up for myself i i chose to run away um and and when you run from a circumstance like that even at a young age you know kids just have a way of of seeing the weakness um in that person and so so it kind of followed me for quite some time uh, it didn't take until you know I was high school age before I before I started kind of standing up for myself. Bullying to me was uh, honestly it was kind of a way of life. I mean I really really hated school. I even still now when I when I go to my children's school for you know their plays or their or their school events that they have, just walking into the school and having the smells and the sights and the sounds still kind of brings back some uneasy feelings for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear you on that. Um, now, I've read that. So you were born with no fear of consequences. Can you tell us like a little bit about that and like what that means? So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, so consequence doesn't really register with me. Um, you know, I've been told all my life that, that I don't assess risk or consequence like the average person. So my comment would always be, well, what's the average person, right? I mean, who who really understands balance and who doesn't? So, um, you know, I mean, I would do things as uh, – w- when I was younger, I would do things that that typically – you know, typically, typical kids wouldn't do. Um, I was always that kid that if there was a group of boys around and someone dared someone to go to do something or jump off a building or jump off a cliff or – or do any of that, they knew that they could always go to me and say, well, you know what, Justin will do it. And I wouldn't even think twice. Um, you know, there was um, there was one time that we were at at the elementary school and we had fi- found out a way to, to climb on top of the roof, which was, you know, I mean, it's 20, 30 feet in the air. And we had a flagpole that was right next to the school. And we had somehow got the flagpole rope up to where the edge of the the school was at, and you know the friends were kind of teasing and saying, "Well, who's who's going to be the first one that's going to jump off, or who's the first one that, that that's going to swing off the building?" And I remember just not even not even thinking and grabbed the rope and swung off the building, and you know, kind of looking back now, <laughs> you know, I mean that's. That's one of those crazy things that um, that I probably shouldn't have done, but you know the, the the fear of getting hurt or the fear of 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 getting in trouble from you know my parents or stuff that that just really never crossed my mind back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then how did this kind of you know continue to play out as you became an adult? Well, as as I've gotten older, I, I would like to say that it's mellowed out a little bit, but truth be known, it it doesn't. Um, I still don't have, I still don't really comprehend consequence and risk very well. Um, I guess that's part of, you know, one of the reasons why I, you know, I have my profession and, you know, I drive race cars and, and, and do the things that I do. Um, How old were you when you got into racing? Uh, at 17, uh, you know, I'd, I'd been riding dirt bikes for probably since I was 12, um, with my dad. And then, you know, I got married, you know, really, really young and, and, uh, started racing just shortly after I, you know, I, I got married and, and I've been doing it ever since. Mm-hmm. Did it feel like just kind of a natural fit for you? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definite natural fit. I mean, it, the, the one thing that I, that I really try to convey to people is that it didn't matter what type of of chaos that was going in on in my life at that time, you know, whether I was having problems with my parents or, 
you know, or school or girls or, or, or whatever. Um, it was the second that I could put on my helmet, um, all of the chaos of the outside world would go away. And that was, um, at a young age, that was kind of my medication. That was before I, you know, I, I was diagnosed with, with class one bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was, uh, I mean, that was my drug. That's how I survived. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and how old were you when you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder? Uh, diagnosed was probably 11 years ago. Um, so going on what, I was probably 31, 32 years old. Okay. So I went I went a long time without actually having a name to, to what was going on. Mm-hmm. Did you have a sense of maybe that's what it was, or was it kind of just completely unexpected when you got diagnosed with it? Well, you know, like I said, I knew that I knew that there was something kind of goofy going on with me, uh, but yeah, you just weren't it, sure what it was. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I had no clue. I mean, if if you even think like even ten years ago, bipolar disorder or mental health um, disorders, they were if you had them, people would think that it was contagious. And it, you know, I mean, it's it's only been until recent that the stigma is slowly starting to go away. Uh, but uh, back then, you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, I knew that there, I knew that there was something going on. Um, but I just, again, I, you know, I, I was really good at hiding, um, uh, the true emotion and the true feeling that I had. And so, um, I kept it to myself. Mm-hmm. How did you feel when you were diagnosed with it? Was it kind of a relief to have, you know, something you know something that you could identify it with and then you know begin to to get treatment or was it was it more of a stressful thing well yeah I don't know if it was necessarily relief um kind of how I I got to the point where I realized that something was going on and that I needed to to kind of figure it out is um there, it was one morning, uh, you know, 10, 10, 11 years ago, I had been kind of on a down cycle, uh, having kind of some depression problems and not very motivated uh, in in life or in work. And so I I woke up just a normal morning like I had typically done, you know, every day for, for as long as I could remember. And I leaned over and kissed my wife. Um, she was still sleeping. It was early. I went upstairs and I, I kissed the children and and um, then I went out back and I grabbed my da- my dog and threw my dog in the back seat and we went off to do our our normal day to day tasks um, for for work. And about an hour hour and a half after I'd, I'd left the house, I found myself at the top of a canyon um, that I'd been to quite often before. And uh, you know I let the dog out and she's running around and you know I. I remember sitting in the truck while I'm listening to my music, just wanting to feel kind of the happiness that, that she was feeling. And uh, I I had this this overwhelming sense of despair and just not wanting to not wanting to, to live with it anymore. And so in uh, in one brief moment of irrational thinking, I reached over into my glove box of my truck. I grabbed my pistol that I had there and I, I loaded it and I put it to my head and I pulled the trigger and um, it didn't go off. Obviously it I, didn't go off, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, it didn't go off. Um, the outcome wasn't quite what I expected by no means. So, mm. uh, you know, all I got from that was it was a, a loud click and, it, you know, of course, at that time feeling, you know, the despair and and feeling, you know, not worth anything. I was, you know, was thinking to myself, how in the world could you screw this up? So I unchambered the bullet and the bullet landed in my lap and I picked it up and I, you know, I kind of looked at the bullet thinking, you know, maybe the gun didn't work right or something, but uh, you could see where the firing pin had actually hit the back of the bullet. So, you know, I, there's speculation of why it didn't go off. You know, I, and and I get it all the time, but um, but that's kind of where I realized that there 
that things had to change for me. Mm-hmm. That, um, that there was no way that I could possibly ever be at that moment again because there's no way that I would be able to get a second chance like that. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the gun should have fired, right? So oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's crazy. I mean, I guess... I guess it was a sign then, right? Yeah, well, but, it, and it, it it definitely goes back to to belief system, you know, and it's, <clears throat> you know, some people have have different beliefs on on why it didn't why you know why it didn't go off, but but for me it was more of um, it was more of just kind of a way of the of the universe saying, look, you know what, you've got you've got a purpose here. Mm-hmm. You need to stay here. You need to figure out what's going on. And then because of the experience, you will be able to have the knowledge of of what you went through. And you can convey that to other people that are going through that same process. And hopefully, you know, with me speaking and with me having the book out and, and those type of things, I mean, hopefully I can affect just one person because that's – at the end of the day, that's all that makes any difference. If mm-hmm. I can, if I can help one person from going to the top of the canyon, then then my goal is is complete. Yeah. yeah. So, what was life like right after that? I mean, did you have any more suicidal thoughts, or had you just kind of like turned a corner at that point? Well, it's the the one thing about having the the disorders is is it's not like it's not like a cold or it's not like the flu. So, it, you know, the colder the flu, you can feel, you can see um, people around you can see that you that you don't feel well and that you're sick. Um, having a having the the mental disorder, uh, it it's has stuck with me the entire time. And so, uh, you know, after the gun didn't go off, I, I was driving down the canyon and I I'd called my doctor and kind of explained to him what had gone on. And, uh, he asked me to come down to his office immediately. So I went down and we, you know, we filled out some paperwork and you know, answered some questionnaires and kind of went through that process. And, and, you know, at first it was, it was a, a depression diagnosis and, uh, it took a bunch of medication, you know, tried a bunch of different things and, and it would always make it worse. It took about another year after that before, uh, the light bulb kind of came, you know, came on and said, Hey, you know, it may, maybe it's, maybe it's something beyond depression. Maybe it's, maybe it's a bipolar disorder or, or even, you know, it's schizophrenia or, or something else. And so, um, so, you know, finding that out and realizing now that this was, this was a struggle that, that I was blessed to have. Uh, now I'm able to control it better. Um, you know, I mean, there's still, there's still thoughts of, of not wanting to be here. You know, I still struggle like the next guy of, of not, of not wanting to get out of bed and, and, and still, you know, struggle with motivation at times. But, but I also know that, that I will never let the disorder define who I am. I'm not the disorder, you know, I'm, uh, my life struggles and the, and the things that I've gone through in the past have made me who I am. But the disorder doesn't define me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you said that you have a class one diagnosis. Um, what, yes. is that, what does that mean exactly? So uh, two different types. There's class one and class two. Um, a class two is more of a short acting um, cycle. So you can have depressive states that are two weeks to a month. And then manic phases um, that will last about the same. Uh, the class one is more of a long-term effect. So, so like my my depression states will last, you know, six months to a year. Um, but then when I turn into a manic, um, um, when I go into the manic phase, they can last for two years at a time. So, so there's huge there's huge swings in that. Um, the crazy thing about having the class one is, is it's really hard for the people around me to, to really comprehend what, what's going on because I can be, I can be in a depressive state. I can be in bed for 30 days at a time and then finally pull myself out of it just enough where, you know, I can get back to work and I can, 
start feeling just a little bit better, but the depression is still always there. Um, in the manic phase, most people around me, or at least most of the people who know me, they know when the manic phase hits because I'm I'm pretty hard to uh, to control, pretty hard to be around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but for the most part, um, it's it's more of just kind of the length of of each cycle that I go through. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So, what sorts of things do you do to help you manage those cycles? Well, the the biggest thing that I do now um, is, well, I, I guess I can't say it's the biggest thing. One one of the things that I do, of course, is medication. Um, you know, I do take meds to kind of you know mood stabilizers and to kind of balance that out. But but the biggest thing that I do and my and the biggest drug that that I have that that helps me is my racing. Um, for me, when I'm able to put the helmet over my face and and to kind of push the whole outside world away. And just focus at, at the task at hand, you know, at at winning the race, at driving fast. Uh, that that to me is my that's my medication. So, which is probably why I'll never stop racing. Yeah, because I know, like I read there in the beginning, you know, you said that you've been able to master your inner dialogue and you know, create a mindset that's made you bulletproof. And I think that that's something that you know a lot of people can struggle with. Um, whether you have bipolar disorder or some other um, uh, mental illness, you know, you're, it can be difficult to really get control of your mind, you know, and, and what you're going through can feel like it's trying to take over and, and run the day, you know. Um, and so has it been, you know, a challenge for you to to do that? Or is it something that, I mean, do you feel like it's, it's gotten easier for you over time. No, I, you know, I don't. I don't necessarily think it, it's gotten any easier um, per se. Uh, but I do believe that because of the experiences and because of of understanding it just a little bit more, um, I'm able to cope with with triggers in in a different way. You know, I'm able to to see it coming just a little bit better um, than I did you know, when I was younger. And I think that that's probably um, I think that's that's what a lot of people uh, struggle with is is you know when you have it at a young age, but you don't have life experience, it's hard to kind of gauge um, your actions uh, based on the lack of experience that you had in life. And so, you know, for me, it's it's a it's a constant day struggle. Um, you know, I push forward every day. And, you know, that was that was kind of one of the other reasons um, that this book for me was so important is because I because I've been able to live the experiences and because I've been able to to experience the the things that I have, you know, I, I I feel like I can relate to the people who who don't have those experiences and it, you know, if I can convey to the, enough to people to just, you know, explain to them that all you need is a voice. If, if you're having a bad day or a bad month or a bad year, get the people that are close around you, get the people that are, you know, that, that love you and that care about you and, and talk about it. And, you know, I mean, they may not understand you. They may not, um, they may think that you're a goofball, but, but that's that's okay because you know they don't necessarily need to understand what's going through your brain. If you can talk about it, it's it's a it's a coping mechanism that um, that if you can talk about it, it helps. At least for me, it helps me understand myself better. Mm-hmm. It probably helps you to feel less alone. Yes. Yeah, even if they don't quite understand where you're coming from. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's so important to be able to reach out to people and to have people to reach out to. Um, so when did you start writing your book and what like kind of led you to, to begin that process? Well, so the, the main reason I wrote the book was actually to um, have a written, a, a written account of my life that I could pass down to my children. So kids were young. You know what I was going through. You know at the, you know at at thirty years old, there's no way that you can explain that to an eight year old. 
And so uh, it was about six months um, after my youngest brother had passed away from an overdose that I kind of I kind of put two and two together in my head and said, you know, it's it's that time that I need to to write things down. I need to write a little bit of, of my life history so I can share that. Well, through the years, it took me a long time to to, to actually accomplish the task. But but through the years, you know, I went from one chapter to to three chapters to twelve chapters, and and eight years later, it ended up being thirty eight chapters. And uh, I was able to find a good editor um, because I now had written 270 pages of this thing. I wanted it. To, I wanted to make sure that it was um, that it was readable, that it was flowable. And so um, I had the editor go through it, and I got a phone call literally like 24 hours after I'd, get, I'd given it to her, and she had powered through the whole thing in one night. And uh, she just she really conveyed to me that there was a powerful message there and that it was something that I had to decide if it was if it was something that I wanted to share to the world or if it was something that I just wanted to keep to myself. And tip and typically I kept everything to myself. But, you know, I I think that that through through my life struggles and through the experiences that I, I, I had had. I had kind of reached that point of of realizing that that no one other than me was going to be able to advocate the experiences that I had, and so um, so decided to to self publish, and um, yeah, here we are today. Yeah, and what's the response been like? And did people know about all your backstory before they read the book? No, I can't. that's kind of funny because no one knew. No, um, no, they, they, like not even my mother, um, not even you know my um, my ex wife or or any of the people that were really, really that were really close to me. Mm. So you no must one, have been scared to put it out there then. Well, yeah, I just it was it was nerve wracking because you know I've always been you know a really quiet person and a really private person, and to be able to finally, you know, come to grips with things and say, you know what, it's okay. I don't care if people judge me. I don't care what people think about me. I'm going to throw this story out there because, you know, hopefully eventually one day it will, um, it will change someone else's life. And, you know, that was, that was my goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now who's this book intended for? Actually, it's intended for pretty much anybody. I, um, I go through um, not only the the mental the mental illness side of things, um, you know. So it, it so I feel like it can help um, it can help relate to those people who are who are having kind of the same thoughts that that I did. Um, but I think it also gives um, people who are living with you know spouses and friends that um, that have the disorder. It kind of gives a little bit of a of a broader spectrum where they can look at, at their friend or their spouse and maybe understand a little bit better of, uh, of what they're going through. Um, you know, I do a lot of life coaching as well and talk about, you know, business management and being able to, to, uh, take a disorder or, or take a struggle and set yourself up well enough that on those days that you don't feel like getting out of bed, that you don't have to that that you can set yourself up um and work hard and never quit and and still have still be able to have your struggle but still be able to be successful at the same time. Mhm. Yeah. Now I know you have a, a a blog post on your site um about making mental health a priority. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I know that that's I agree that that's definitely such an important thing to do. Um, tell us a little more about, you know, the things that you do to make it a priority for yourself. For me, it's always, um, and I do things probably, you know, a bit different than most, which is, uh, which is totally fine. I, and I completely get why I do what I do, but, um, it, so, um, like food, um, nutrition, um, a lot of that is is really really important to me because I you know I do understand that a healthy body 
also helps a healthy mind. And, uh, you know, some of the other things that I do is, is, you know, kind of validate my self-worth every day, you know, understand that, that even though, you know, I, I may be having a bad day, it's still, it's just, it's just one bad day. Um, or, or it could be two bad, uh, two bad days in a row. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, it's understanding that there's still some self-worth and that I'm doing the best that I can in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's so important to kind of have some compassion for yourself, you know, especially when you're not having a good day and just to know that, hey, you know, maybe today's not my best day, but tomorrow might be better, you know. No, of course. Well, you know, one of the things too that I that I really try to convey to people is is that I know that there's a lot of love out there, and there there is, um, you know, like like in a relationship, um, you can love your spouse, and you can have this overwhelming love for your spouse. But I always pose the question: If do you love yourself as much as you love them? And I get kind of funny looks from that because people think that if you love yourself, that you're being selfless or uh, that that you're being selfish. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at it, you know, at the, on, on big picture type thing, that it's impossible to love someone to their fullest if you don't love yourself to the fullest. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's really hard to, um, to show up in the world and, you know, and, and try to help other people when, you're really not helping yourself, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, for myself, I definitely set aside some time each day where I just focus on self-care, you know, or I know, like, what my limits are, and I I just have to try to, you know, honor that. If, I, if I'm going to be able to, to give my best each day, you know? I think. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong in this world with, with, taking care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's, if you're not healthy with you, then you're not going to be healthy with anybody else. And so, so it's just, it's, it's understanding that process and it's understanding that, that we all as humans have a right to be happy and we need to do the things that, that make us happy. And if we can do that, then we can promote happiness, you know, through everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I know you've uh, told us a little bit about, you know, kind of how you're doing today and and things that you still struggle with, with your disorder. Um, What would you say has been maybe the biggest challenge in living with bipolar disorder? Oh, geez. Um, (laughs) I think probably the biggest challenge is not really understanding what cycle I'm in at the time that I'm in that cycle. Mm. So... So the one thing that that people have a hard time understanding is that you know like when I'm when I'm in a manic phase, I feel incredible. I don't feel like there's anything wrong. You know, I'm 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 very motivated, and the companies are going really well, and and I'm racing faster, and and so for me, everything just seems perfect, and I don't really have that concept of that I'm in, that I'm in a manic phase. So the flip side of that is, is the depressive side is that when, you know, when I'm tired or when I don't have any motivation and I decide or I choose to stay in bed for days at a time, I still don't think that there's anything wrong. I just feel like that my body needs to rest and recover. And so really understanding how the cycle flows um, is still a struggle for me and, and really trying to, to be self-aware of where I'm at in each one of those cycles. Um, it's constant. It doesn't go away. It's not like the flu or it's not like a cold. I mean, you, you can have good days and bad days when you have the flu, but, but ultimately the flu goes away and then you're back, you know, you're back to normal. Having a mental disorder, it's one of those things that's invisible. People can't physically see it. It's not cancer or not a diabetes but it's still there and it's still, it's still tangible to the person who's actually living it. 
that's what can make it feel so challenging is like you know that something is wrong or you don't feel right but other people can't see that you know they can't put their finger on it so it's harder for people to understand that you know you're struggling with the depression or the mania you know in your case with the bipolar disorder um as opposed to you know having some physical illness that they can actually um can see you know yes well thank you for for sharing that um and so justin tell us more about you know what it is you do today and everything that you have going on well mostly today is just um you know i'm focused a lot on my racing of course um, it's been part of my life for 25 years. And so, so I do have 38 weekends a year, you know, I mean, we, we travel all over the country and, and, you know, I get, I get to be able to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm one of, of, uh, of about 200 guys in the United States that get to do what I do. Um, and then on top of that, the other, you know, my other main focus is just bringing awareness to, uh, to mental health and to be an advocate. Um, I, I've been a, you know, I've been able to have the opportunity to, to, to speak quite, a, um, quite a bit to groups of people, to college, um, to college students, to, you know, high school and junior high students, um, to business owners. So it, it, it's one of those things where, I'm trying to spread the knowledge and and ultimately at the end of the day I'm trying to end the stigma of of what a mental illness really is. Uh, you know, I get that I'm a goofy kid. I'm okay with that and but we all have a little you know we all have a little bit of goofy in us. And and so, you know, with me being able to focus on on bringing awareness and and ending the stigma, I mean that's right now that's my true path. Mhm. Yeah, no, that's that's a great thing. And uh, where can people find your book? So the book is uh, is available on my website. It's uh, justinpeck.com. dot com. Um, we've also got uh, we've got it on Amazon and Kindle as well. Uh, in fact, we just we just hit the the Amazon bestseller list about three weeks ago. So oh, nice. I was pretty happy about that one. So. Um, and then, you know, on, on the website we have, um, I write blogs and, and, you know, just kind of go through some of my experiences and, and, and some suggestions on, on how I've overcome, you know, a few of my, uh, struggles in life. Uh, my email is there as well. Uh, you know, I, I spend, you know, a good portion of my day answering the emails and, and having people, you know, reach out and, and and ask for advice, which I don't typically like to give advice. I um, I mostly just kind of go over you know what I did um, to beat kind of the the struggles that that I've went through. But but it's good to be able to to listen to other people and and to be able to explain to people that you know that there are other people out there that are willing to listen and that they're not alone. And as long as they stand up and they have a voice and they talk to people about it, that, that their life can change. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's great that you are helping people in that way. And I'm sure that it's making a difference in many people's lives already. I hope so. so yeah. Um, so I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today before I let you go. And yeah. that is given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? The biggest piece of advice I would ever give myself is to raise my voice. Meaning if I would have talked about it more, um, if I would have taken the, the group of people around me that, that I knew that cared about me. And if I was, able to explain to them a little bit better about what I was going through, I think that my life would, would be a little different. Um, I would have realized that the struggles weren't so off the wall because I always thought that I was really, really unique in the, in the way that my mindset would, would, would come across. So if I had to do you know something different or if I had the advice to give, it would just 
I would say just stand up and have a voice. Talk to the people that love you because they can always help. They're they're your biggest support group. Yeah, no, that's that's great advice. And of course, you know, it's like not always easy for us to do that. And especially if we don't feel like we have the people around us um, who are going to be there to support us. But so I think that's why, you know, it's so great that uh, there are people like you doing what you're doing that are hopefully giving people, you know, the ability to speak out and to feel safe and comfortable doing that. Yes. If we can just give people, for me, if I can just provide some type of sense of purpose for, uh, for others, if I can, if I can affect that one person where they don't drive to the top of the Canyon or where they don't feel that despair, um, then my life work is, is, is being accomplished. Yeah. So, um, I know you've mentioned, um, your website and we're going to have that linked up on the show notes page. Um, are there any other links that you want to mention other ways that people can get in touch with you? Uh, we have the typical Facebook and, and, and Instagram and social media stuff. Um, Justin pet 49, uh, is the Instagram. Um, I do have a, a, a public figure page. Um, just my name, Justin Peck. On those links, I mean, they have you know the the side links to the racing and and you know and stuff like that. If people would like to see kind of what I do on that end, but um, but yeah, just mostly just just the website um, justinpack dot com. I mean, it has a lot of good information, um, and it has um, yeah. Here again, it it it's that information. It's being able to read the blogs. It's being able to to um, understand that that you're not alone. All right. Well, that sounds good. And I will have all your social media links up there on the show notes page as well. And other than that, Justin, I just want to thank you for coming on here today and for sharing your story with us and for, I think, you know, providing us with some hope and some inspiration uh, for anyone who is struggling. And uh, yeah, just, you know, thank you for, for that. Thank you for what you do. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 103. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Justin Peck to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope that you found some inspiration in Justin's story. I think it's really incredible how things have turned around for him since that moment when he tried to take his life. Clearly, he was destined for more and to live out his purpose, which he's doing today. And I believe that if you are here and if you are listening to this, you are destined for more as well. And my message to you today is simple. Don't give up. Even if things are tough right now and if you feel hopeless, don't give up. One of the things I've learned is that things can change quicker than you might expect. I know it's hard when life is hard, but don't give up. The world needs your contribution. And be sure to come back in two weeks for the next episode. I will say this about it. I think we're going to be doing something that will be a first for the show. And that's all I'm going to say right now. But come back in two weeks to find out what that will be. And just a couple of quick reminders to leave you with. If you like what I'm doing here and you want to help support the show, I have a Patreon campaign set up over at thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You'll find some perks over there in return for your support, and your support helps me cover the expenses of doing the show, as well as allow me to do more with it. So feel free to check that out if you're interested in that, and you can find that linked up on the website as well. Also, if you're interested in getting some coaching, reach out to me at melissa at thegrassgetsgreener.com, and we can discuss that. I do offer a free 90-minute call, so reach out if that's something you'd like to explore. And also, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope.